Good afternoon. My name is Thurman Greco, and this is the Let's Live show, and we are producing this show this afternoon for our YouTube. Uh, we will be demonstrating a, a reflexology session, and I will be reading from my reflexology textbook, which is available as a blog under Reflexology for the Spirit as well. And our practitioner this afternoon is a, a young lady who is a student of mine and who is an excellent reflexologist. Her name, and she's in Woodstock, and her name is Arlene Ferrieri. Arlene, would you like to introduce yourself just a little bit? Tell, tell people where you practice. And okay. Um, well, I've been a reflexologist now for about seven years. I studied with Thurman. Uh, I have a practice called Soul to Soul Reflexology, and I am located uh, in Woodstock on Wittenberg Road. I have a, a space in my home, and um, I, you know, see people regularly for various, um, I'll say, ailments, um, from diabetes to just being overwhelmed with life and stressed, um, and. Um, so if you are interested in a session, um, Thurman will be able to give you more information uh, yes. later on in the show. Thank you. Okay, so this afternoon I'm going to read, I'm going to read from the textbook and Arlene is going to offer reflexology to the feet and we are going to offer a, a visual description of how reflexology works. And this is the second session that we've done. And we're gonna start with bunions. Uh, bunions are definitely spiritual afflictions. They're very common, they are becoming more common. They've been around for generations and generations and generations. And because of their location on the foot, bunions are a way of dealing with love, a romance or loss thereof. And people suffering with bunions, for my explanation, have a lack of a carefree sense of acceptance of anything. There's a definite personality thread that goes with people who have bunions. Professionals can't totally agree on what causes bunions. Flat feet, ill-fitting shoes, a congenital disposition toward bunions. But this much is certain, getting surgery to repair bunions is becoming more and more popular and having the bunions recur after surgery is also a reality. Reflexology for the spirit practitioners can help both before and after the surgery. And wearing proper footwear is, is totally important for a person who suffers with bunions. You can be a real help to your client as a reflexology for the spirit practitioner if you notice what kind of footwear she or he is using and either approve of it or suggest footwear that you think is improper, that you think is proper. The wrong kind of footwear can be very destructive to your client's foot health as well as to the overall spinal alignment. When people wear the shoes that don't fit right or that don't offer the support that's needed for the type of situation that's required by the foot that the shoe is on, um, that it just causes other problems. Bunion sufferers should wear shoes that are well-fitting. The shoes should be non-binding. They should have a generous toe box and they should not have a heel that is higher than two inches. And sandals can also offer relief and there are a lot of really nice fashionable looking sandals now that bunion sufferers can wear. And if the bunion sufferer also has arch problems, a trip to a professional um, who can properly fit an arch support is also important. But we need to also understand, now that we're talking about feet, we need to also understand that what society does to women and their shoes should be, I believe, cr criminal. Right now, women are wearing shoes that have extremely high heels. They are then wearing platforms. I'm sure 
that there are women out there every day who fall and break an ankle, they're breaking metatarsal bones, the alignment to the spine is wrong, the pressure that's being put on the knees is, is extreme. These shoes are not doing anything for the people who are wearing them, besides increasing your doctor bills and your podiatrist bills in the future. Uh, a smart woman in today's market would be very careful about the shoes that she's wearing. Make sure that you are wearing shoes that are going to keep your feet healthy. You have no need to fall and break an ankle. You have no need to ruin your knees. You have no need to get, to get your spine out of alignment. That's just not me. All for the sake of fashion, I, I can't go there. When you are a foot reflexologist and you are getting ready to work the foot of a person who um, has bunions, begin by working the solar plexus. The solar plexus, by, and, and I know that I, people have heard me say this many, many times, Working the solar plexus is probably one of the most important things that you can do for a client. It's one of the most important things that you can do for yourself is working the solar plexus. And after you work the solar plexus, work the skeletal system. Work the entire skeletal system. Work all of the bones and all of the joints in the foot. And work the spine. Work the neck bones. Work all of the bones uh, that, that in the body. And then move on to the muscular system. And after that, you work the nervous system. And then you work the neck area. And of course, working the neck area, you can just do uh, neck rotations on the toes. And then work your, the circulatory system. And always work the bunion area and all the toes. That's extremely important. So when you work this now, you're working the skeletal, you're working the muscular, you're working the nervous system, you're working the neck area, and you're working the circulatory system. There are a number of essential oils that you can use when you are working with a person who has uh, a bunion issues. You can work, uh, you can use angelica, bergamot, geranium, lavender, lang lang, frankincense, lemon, palmarosa, rosewood, jasmine, helichrysum, sandalwood, roman chamomile, and rose. So there's a large selection of essential oils that you can use. And when you go to a store to purchase your essential oils, try to purchase an oil that has a batch number on the label. That's very important. Uh, it's very important because it shows that this batch of oil has been tested by a third party uh, tester who is saying that what's in this bottle is what's on the label. And that's extremely important. I think also we need to realize the importance. When you're working on a person with bunions, you're working on a person that's got some physical issues. And these physical issues, in many cases, are affecting this person's ability to move forward in life. Because with bunions, when they become uh, serious, when they begin to bother the person and you can't walk as much as you need to walk, you're not getting through life. It's, life is not as easy as it has been in the past. So that's an important thing to realize when you're working on your client that this person not only has bunions, but the person has having some difficulties as well. Uh, the next thing we're gonna cover is we're gonna cover calluses and corns. And they can also be very troublesome. They can represent spiritual challenges. You know, a person with bunions can have calluses in the bunion area. They can have corns in the bunion area. So you can actually have two complications in the same place on a foot. And the impact that calluses and corns have on your client partner depends upon where they're located on the foot or the toes. So if a person has corns and calluses 
and they're up around the toes, that's going to have one impact on the life of the person. If a person has uh, corns and calluses and they're down in the heel area, that's going to have another impact. Because if they're up around uh, the neck or the big toe, if they're up around the toes, then those calluses and corns are going to affect the head, they're going to affect the stress level if they're up around the base of the toes and into the neck area. If they're over on the bunion area, that's the heart. These, these calluses and corns are going to have an impact on that part of the body. But if the calluses and corns are down around the heel, you're going to be impacting uh, the basic life views, a person's core beliefs as it were, will be impacted by these corns and calluses. So don't run the corns and calluses short at all. Definitely respect them. And if you possibly can, get your client to go to a podiatrist and have them removed. They should be professionally removed because there is a, 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 a problem. You can, can have the possibility of an infection when you try to remove these corns and calluses. So it's best to just go and have them uh, professionally taken care of. Now, risk factors for calluses and corns include bunions and wearing ill-fitting shoes. And so you wanna make sure again that you need well-fitting shoes and that you have the right shoes on, that your shoes are, are fit you and that you have room for your toes, that you're not coming out of the back of the shoe when you're walking, that, but at the same time, you don't want them so tight. You want, you want to have a, a shoe that is comfortable. If you try on a shoe and it is not comfortable, do not say to yourself, well, gosh, I'll wear this a few times and then the shoes will fit. And be. That's not the case. If you try on a shoe and it's not comfortable, do not walk out of the store with it. You only go out of the store with shoes that are comfortable. Okay. For many, corns and calluses are armor, they are defense mechanism, and they offer protection. So when you see corns and calluses, think protection, think armor. Think of um, a soul crying out for protection, and think of a person needing protection from unbearable outside events. Because a callus and a, and a corn is a serious commitment that your body is making toward protection. That callus and corn did not appear in an instant. <clears throat> it took a long time to grow, and it, in itself, a callus and corn can be um, very painful. So you need to uh, respect that callus and respect the corns and realize that they are saying to the human, you got to get your act together because we are, you know, your feet are disturbed. Now, if a callus appears in the heart area, then you can pretty well be sure that the person has got some heart area problems, that the lifestyle um, they're having some. Um, they're having some issues with with love, and if it th appears on the throat area of the foot, then you have problems that are relating to communication. And of course, as we said a few minutes ago, calluses that are on the heel have to do with core beliefs, and there is a relevant place for reflexology for the spirit when dealing with these spiritual issues. Reflexology is an energetic modality, and it does deal with the spiritual results, the spiritual causes, the spiritual effects of, of diseases and life situation. If you have a client person coming to you regularly with calluses or corns, be sure and refer that person to a podiatrist because they, the podiatrist needs to treat the medical aspects. And people should not, again, self-treat calluses and corns because they can end up with worse problems than they started with. And if your client is a diabetic, then you're going to have even more problems. 
several trips to the chiropractor in order if your client's gait is being impacted upon. And you know, <clears throat> if a person comes into you as a reflexologist and you realize that the person's shoes are not right, you can take one look at how the person is standing and you can know right away whether or not the person needs to go to a chiropractor or not. And they might as well. You've got to get the spine aligned. You've got to, you, you have to help your client to be aware of the importance of the spinal alignment. You need to help your client be aware of the fact that one shoulder may be higher than the other one or one hip may be higher than the other one or um, the way the back is curved is not going to be conducive uh, to good health. And also if you have a client who comes to you and complains about hamstrings, that person has got some issues with spinal alignment. Short, when, you, when a person has tight hamstrings, that's a setup for back pain. And so you need to help your client deal with this. And, and one of the best things that you can do is send them to a chiropractor. You might, if you have the time, go out and, and interview a couple of chiropractors in your area and make sure that you've got a chiropractor that you can refer to these people that you trust, that you believe that this person is going to work, that this, person, that this person's techniques are going to work with your clients. Because you have to realize that all chiropractors are different. Uh, chiropractors are not alike. And then, once you've sent this person to the chiropractor, it's up to you, uh, the practitioner, to facilitate the spiritual and emotional and physical healing that comes with regular sessions. And you know, if a person comes into you with calluses and corns and bunions, you're not gonna take care of this in one session. They may come to you with one session, but if, and you may do some dramatic things for this person, but it's really hard to perform a miracle in one session. You need several anyway. Also, each time you offer reflexology for the spirit, Look at the color of the feet. Uh, where are the red spots in the feet? If there are red spots on the feet, what color are the corns? What color are the calluses? Uh, if they're red, you're going to look for anger. If they're white, you're going to look for a person that's really just having a terrible time, is at the end of his or her tether, and totally exhausted with the situation. So whenever you see white spots on the bottom of the feet, you're looking at exhaustion. And once you resolve these issues for your client, he or she is going to be able to move forward in life much better. And that's extremely important. So when you're going to work the feet of a person who has corns and calluses, you're going to work the whole body. You're going to work the whole foot. You're going to include the liver and the solar plexus holes in each session, and you're going to incorporate Reiki therapy if you can. It's really going to be helpful. And there are several really nice essential oils that are good for uh, corns and, and calluses. Tea tree is one of them, melaleuca is one, lavender, and then the chamomile, so either German or Roman. And now we are going to go on to constipation. We're going to change the subject totally. We're going to go on to constipation. Constipation is a really interesting situation that people bring to your table. And most of the time they don't talk about it at all. Uh, March Durso used to say that 50% of the people who come to, to a reflexologist table have got problems. They have issues with constipation. And I believe it. But a lot of the times... You, A, don't even know that the person is suffering with constipation until you start working their feet or until after the fact when the person comments. It's very hard to receive a foot reflexology session and be constipated. And so a person who receives regular reflexology is just not going to have that problem. So the good news is that the condition seldom continues once a person comes to you. 
and this is true of both children and adults, when you work the digestive system, system you help the, the intestinal tract normalize itself. And this is, you know, this is really important with children. People who have um, children under five, a lot of the times the children have problems with constipation. They don't like to go into the bathroom. They don't like to use the toilet. They don't like to have a bowel movement and they resist and, and they create health problems. And of course, it's a lot of stress and trauma for the parents because mothers really want to know that the child is having a regular bowel movement. I know from experience that if you have a client with a child that's having problems, it won't be long. With reflexology, that child cannot not go to the bathroom. I, it just works. And you can give a little child a 10-minute session or a 15-minute session, and that child is going to not have constipation problems. It just, you cannot help it. And of course, constipation has a whole set of risk factors. There, because there are things, there are lifestyle issues that contribute to constipation. And one of them is a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, I have recently begun to spend, um, as an aside, hours uh, at my computer because I'm writing blogs and I'm writing a book and I'm, you know, I'm doing a lot of writing. I get up every hour and I exercise for 10 or 15 minutes. I'll get out and walk. I will exercise. I will do something to keep moving. A sedentary lifestyle is not good if you've got a, a problem with constipation. So that's something that you need to keep in, 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 in mind. Also, eating a low fiber, high fat diet is not good. You need to eat a high fiber diet and you need to eat not too much fat. And you need to get enough liquids. That's extremely important. And of course, a lot of the liquids that we drink nowadays do not hydrate us. They dehydrate us. So you need to make sure that the liquids that you're drinking do not dehydrate you. Now, in my opinion, not getting enough vitamin C also contributes to constipation. So you need to make sure that you're getting enough vitamin C. And it's also difficult for a human body to achieve optimum health without a clean intestinal tract. So many things throughout the body can be improved as the intestinal tract begins to function properly. So you get the intestinal tract working properly through reflexology, but you also can offer cleanses. You can also help things that way, but you don't have to. Because when you offer reflexology to a person, you are offering a gentle detox, and it happens. I mean, it's just part of receiving reflexology is the body is going to experience a gentle detox. So when you have a client partner coming in for regular reflexology for the spirit sessions, uh, you're gonna see a person who begins to feel better, who begins to look better, who begins to develop better eating habits, who has more energy and has a better outlook on life. So there's a lot of changes that will go on with reflexology for the spirit. And a colon cleanse can sometimes, once this whole process starts, and once you realize the person is feeling better, has more energy, is eating better, it might be a good idea to have a colon cleanse. And of course, that's a very, very simple thing to do. Uh, you go to the um, Sunflower Natural Foods Market or you go to uh, a drugstore, you go to a health food store and get yourself a gentle colon cleanse and use it. That's it. And all it involves is mixing a drink or taking a couple of pills and doing that every day for several days as your body begins to regulate itself and get itself on a new uh, pattern of habits. So another thing that you can do to normalize the colon function is after your bath, you can do what we call dry brushing. 
and that's where you take a brush and you brush the skin after you have taken a shower or a bath and I recommend uh, I recommend showers but you can also use a, a little trampoline a personal trampoline that will offer some um, cleansing properties and health giving properties using the trampoline as well and now when you have um, a uh, situation with constipation you want to work the digestive system you want to work the immune system you want to work the lymphatics you want to work the urinary system the liver and the solar plexus so there's a lot involved in working the digestive system and overcoming uh, constipation so you do have several different body systems that are there but you know once you get things moving and you get the body going in the direction of healthy bowel movements the body will uh, bring about its own homeostasis because that's really what reflexology is all about is receiving um, instructions through your hands for um, a homeostasis homeostasis is all about getting well and staying well and um, you want to work with this if you're going to have essential oils you're going to use anise peppermint ginger fennel and tarragon so there's a lot that you can do the next thing we're going to talk about is eczema and eczema is a very um, interesting situation because it's not contagious, but it is a skin condition. It is an itchy, red skin irritation. And you have the itching before you have the red. You know, a lot of times when we have something wrong in our body and we're itching, the, you'll have red blotches or red areas, or you'll have some, some areas that are red. Your arm will be red, um, your face will, something will turn red. But with, with eczema, the red comes later. So there are several different things that encourage uh, eczema. Uh, one is stress. The other one is a, an overloaded immune system. And allergies. Allergies have a lot to do with eczema. All of these things respond to regular sessions. So... The first thing you want to do is try to give some regular reflexology sessions to the person and try to get them comfortable with reflexology and quite try to get them to realize that in some way, although it's different with every person, in some way this person is uh, receiving a gentle cleanse and is getting better. And... Um, you also need to realize that there are triggers to eczema and you need to learn what those triggers are. Sometimes it's um, allergies. Sometimes it's something going on in the house that has the person upset. Sometimes it's a change in weather. You just don't know what these triggers are until you learn what these triggers are. So you want to figure out what those triggers are and then you want to work with them. Now, uh, an eczema sufferer struggles with negative attitudes towards events in his or her life. So this person is um, being negative toward his or her own life as opposed to being negative toward the life out there. So that's a, a, a specific focus that the anger takes. And what happens is when, when a person has eczema and they may not have any outburst or outbreak or anything but they know that they've got to get on the table so they're going to share the table and other people are going to be around etc etc then they go into um, realizing that there are other people and saying you know maybe I need to not do this after a while because and that's perfectly okay it's a perfectly normal approach but what I suggest to people is that if you are looking to get a situation calmed and you go to a reflexology for the spirit practitioner who does calm the situation, be grateful. 
rather than pulling away and continue to go and get sessions. One thing that is going to happen is you are going to see an eczema outbreak because of the negativity in what you're doing, but it is going to be better. And because you're a new agency, we are a new agency, there have been a lot of things going on, so we're able to incorporate those into what's happening in our lives. Typical things that can set off an eczema about include food, drugs, animal dander, metals, fragrances, cleaning products, emotional stress, anger, uh, weather changes. All these things to together can offer um, a serious um, help to the eczema person because they, ha they have all of these things and then if you can offer reflexology, if you can help them with a cleanse, if you can help them to clean up their lives as in their atmospheres, then you are going to offer a real help. Uh, there are a lot of topical things that can set off eczema. That was what I was just talking about, the, the, uh, the, the area around you, the room, the yard, the desk where you work, etc., etc. You're looking at um, foods, drugs, animal dander, certain metals, fragrances, cleaning supplies, emotional stress, anger, uh, poor circulation, weather changes. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that can create an eczema attack. And so once you learn this, you can figure out ways to help the person. A little sun every day can be helpful. 10 minutes a day cannot hurt you, and it could help you. And of course, eczema is an immune system disorder, so having a clean environment is very important. And I just spoke about that about 30 seconds ago. Once you clean up your environment, you're not going to have the problems with eczema that you had in the past. And what that means is cleaning up your house. But it also means cleaning up your house um, with the proper toxins the proper soaps, the proper things. If you could clean your house with plain water, that's probably the best thing you could do, but it's very hard to do that. So what we have to do is we have to find a soap that we can use that's not going to make us all um, uh, stressed out because we're having trouble breathing and we're having trouble seeing and we're having trouble all these different things because that's what happens with the eczema. And so you also want the person to not only get themselves clean, but to clean up their environment, to clean up the home, the car, the air, the water, the body, the workplace. So they can't just say, well, I'll try to clean up the coffee table and then that'll be clean and that's it. You're gonna have to go in and clean everything up and you're gonna have to get rid of a lot of things that are not doing you any good. And if they were doing you good, they wouldn't be calling, causing eczema. So there's a reason why you need, need to get rid of these things. Uh, you need to help the person clean out the toxins, and then you need to help the person replace what has been gone with non-toxic um, materials and non-toxic things and non-toxic events. So, and that includes cleaners, that includes cosmetics, that includes all kinds of things. So your client partner is also going to be embarking on this journey because your client partner actually goes to work and lives in the house and is a part of the family. So when he or she comes home from work tonight, he or she needs to get told, well, I got rid of this and this and this because of the eczema and it's not healthy and it's not safe and, and I had to get rid of it. Now, there are certain things that you can also do as far as essential oils are concerned that would be really, really good. You can do um, lavender and you can do frankincense. And of course, that's a wonderful thing. I mean, lavender is one of the most 
healing essential oils on the face of the planet. That's extremely important. So if you can get your hands on some lavender and offer the lavender to the person who's doing all the work, that would be great. Okay, so we're going to also get rid of all the toxic cleaners in the house. We're going to replace them with non-toxic cleansers, and we're going to get rid of all the toxic cosmetics, and we're going to replace them with toxic, non-toxic cosmetics. And by doing this, your client partner is going to be going on a journey because now his or her environment has totally changed. We are changing all of the environment around your client partner, which can contribute to this disease anymore. So we could be getting rid of the phone. We could be getting rid of all kinds of cleansers and all kinds of soaps and all kinds of things like that. We're going to be washing clothes to get rid of the soap res residue as opposed to just, well, we'll just wear them until, until they don't have the soap residue anymore. That's kind of a slow way of doing it, and we really need to get this ball rolling. It's not going to happen overnight as it is, so we need to start working on joining this journey, embarking on this journey of wellness and embarking on this journey of clean living. That's very, very important. And um, we have to realize that a, a, a healthcare clean body is very clean from the outside, it's very clean from the inside, the environment is clean, the, everything around it is clean. That includes the car, that includes your office, that includes your home. So you don't just say, well, I'll get rid of the Mr. Clean or I'll get rid of whatever and I'll start cleaning with something else. You have to really go after these things and you have to find out what it is that's causing this problem. And you're, the way you're going to do that is you're going you're gonna to give up certain cleansing attitudes and you're going to use maybe water or you're going to use something that you know is not going to cause any side effects and then through time you're going to add more and more of these non-toxic cleansers you're going to add more and more natural clothing clothing that does not have a uh, plastic in it because you know Clothing that has a lot of polyester is not good for you if you have eczema. So you need to get yourself into a much more pure state if you're going to try to live with eczema as if you didn't have it. So you're going to have a diet which is free of toxins, which is really not difficult right now because right now we have a wonderful nutritionist who is here with us. We have Liz, and she is available throughout, during the week and throughout the week and on the weekends. Liz is excellent. She knows what we should eat, how we should cook it, when we should eat. She really knows all these things, and she's very happy to share these things with us. So we are cleaning up the environment. We are cleaning out the body and we are getting rid of stressful issues in our lives. So we're not running away from them. There's a difference between getting rid of them and running away from them. What we are doing is we are breaking down what we have in our life that is causing stress, that is causing problems, that is causing outbreaks on our skin because these outbreaks are kind of like little temper fits. Your skin is saying, I can't handle this anymore. There are so many toxins in this house. There's so many toxins in this car. There's so many toxins at work. I just can't take it anymore. So it's up to us to clean out the body and clean out the environment. So once everything is cleaned up and everything is cleaned out, it's going to be much easier to cope with stress. And if the stress level is reduced, then the eczema attacks will be reduced. Now there are, when you work 
eczema, you're going to work the entire immune system because eczema is a, an immune system situation. You're going to work the liver, you're going to work the lymphatics, you're going to work the digestive system, and you're going to work the solar system, solar plexus. And then finally, you're going to use either lavender or frankincense. And of course now frankincense is very popular uh, right now as a spiritual oil. Frankincense kind of comes and goes, but right now it's very, very popular. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover fatigue. Fatigue is one of seven symptoms that I list uh, throughout my classes as being serious symptoms for disease. A reason to go to the doctor is to be fatigued. If you're tired and you're getting enough sleep and you're trying to get rest, you need to go see a doctor because fatigue should be alleviated with um, some exercise, with sleep, and with not overdoing uh, the social life or not working like crazy 90 to 100 hours a week. If you live like a human being, you should not be stressed. So that's an important thing. We all suffer from fatigue. Uh, that's just a fact of life. But we also have to realize that fatigue can hide disease. It can be that we're just tired, but it also can hide disease. So that's one of the things that we need to take away from here. Uh, some people are so tired all the time that they just ignore the whole thing. You cannot do that. You have to honor fatigue and you have to respect fatigue. And you have to make sure that fatigue is addressed by a physician. So with fatigue being the first symptom of many diseases, such as a flu, chronic fatigue syndrome, thyroid problems, cancer, anemia, allergies, sinus infection, sleep deprivation, depression. These are all things that are come about as a result of fatigue. So we need to kind of watch the fatigue level and get it down as much as we can. It can be one of the most important symptoms that a person will experience. Warning of us of a disease it can all be, also be the symptom of a person whose energy systems are running on dry. The person can be running on dry in financially, running on dry emotionally, running on dry physically, just running on dry. And if they are, then the solution is rest. And if they're not, then you have to ask yourself, are you um, being, asked to work beyond what you're capable of doing and are you with well with trying to deal with your fatigue and many people have problems giving up the fatigue fatigue becomes like a friend it's something that you live with you may not like it but we all have friends that we don't like all that much but we're used to it and we just simply don't want to give it up so we have to decide, is this fatigue physical? Is it mental? Is it emotional? Is it spiritual? And we need to support our clients through reflexology to seeking a fatigue-free life. And of course, one of the ways that you help a person is with regular reflexology sessions. And you can encourage that person to sleep better you can encourage that person to be relaxed. You can encourage that person to simplify his or her life. You can encourage that person to go to the doctor and get a physical. I mean, there are just any number of things that you can do for a fatigue sufferer. And when you offer regular sessions to a fatigue sufferer, you are offering an opportunity to find deep relaxation and homeostasis, which is extremely important for fatigue. So you can also, while you're doing this, I like to send my clients to a nutritionist. You know, a lot of times we're taking vitamins, we're taking minerals, but we're taking all the wrong kinds. 
or if we're not taking the wrong kinds, we are taking uh, a brand that is not suitable for us. In other words, you may need the vitamin D, but you're taking the wrong brand. So, or you may need the vitamin C, but you need to come up with the right kind of vitamin C. So, you know, a, a person, know, people who know this, people who make a living doing this are much better than somebody just standing, uh, you know, in front of the shelves at the drugstore saying, oh man, which one of these do I need? Do I need this one? Do I need that one? You don't know. And when you try to buy vitamins and minerals on your own, unless you've done some studying, you're just a pig in the poke. You are not getting, oftentimes, what you think you should be getting. Now, when you get ready to work a person with uh, fatigue, issues with fatigue, you need to work the immune system, the skeletal system, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the digestive system, the liver, and the solar plexus. And then once your person has gone to a doctor and gotten a diagnosis, you may want to change some of this a little bit because the diagnosis is going to offer other opportunities for you. But this is good for a start. And then, of course, until you receive a diagnosis from a physician, you can offer peppermint, nutmeg, lemongrass, juniper, basil, lemon, rosemary, black pepper, and thyroid. So there's a lot of different essential oils that you can offer to a person who is suffering with fatigue. And so this is going to end this session, and we will be coming back with another session again soon. And thank you so much, Arlene. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>